alive! So good to be back. I really, really missed you guys. Real quick before we jump into the video, yes, I'm alive. Things have been crazy. And every time I thought we were out of the woods, something else just kept piling on. Uh, if you want to skip this brief update on me personally, timestamp is down in the description below because I love you guys. First off, we bought a new house. I'm super thrilled about this because not only does it have a pool and a you know, pretty sizable backyard for the dogs, which we're really happy about. But I now actually have a true office with like, you know, an actual door instead of the curtains that I had to use in the last house's dining room that I was using as an office. Also, while I did have a studio room in the old house, I now have a pretty sizable studio room, which I'm hoping will help have the space to help keep me a little bit more organized than I have been. So when we bought this house, we did a lease back, which in layman means after closing, we officially owned the house and actually became the landlords for the previous owner for about a week. Now, my wife and I did this lease back for the seller, really just kind of out of the goodness of our hearts with no deposit, no rent for an extra week because, hey, they had a daughter and we were just trying to do the Christian thing and be a little accommodating uh, for them to just give them some time to move out. Unfortunately, they just didn't move out of the house, like at all. And we actually had to serve them an eviction notice, which was super fun to learn about, let me tell you. Then they decided to vandalize the house a bit in anger by leaving garden stones, those big ones in the driveway that we might hit at night if we didn't see them. They dumped their aquarium pebbles all over the flower bed. They broke a window. They stuffed a garbage or a rag down in the garbage disposal. They smoked everywhere in the house really badly in the master bedroom, throwing cigarette butts everywhere. Oh, and they wrote, quote, suck a butt inward in permanent marker on our fuse box. While dealing with this, my 91 year old grandmother passed away, which wasn't a surprise to any of us, but really, really tough on my mother. And my wife and I were trying to renovate a tiny bit before we moved in because of all of the smoke smell in the house now, after which we got the wrong tile delivered to us for a week, then a five day install ended up taking 10 days. And then I just couldn't get internet installed like at all. All of this is while we still own the old house right now and are actually renovating that one to sell. So, needless to say, I'm thrilled to be back. Okay, enough about me. I've now officially caught you all up as to why we didn't have any videos for a good stretch there. I'm alive, energized, and content will be returning to a more consistent basis immediately. Now, let's talk about making money with Dungeons and Dragons, but doing it in the right way without getting sued. I really wanted to make this video because I have had multiple people approach me over the last year with a book they've been working on or a product that they've been working on. And I had to sort of crush their dreams a bit because they hadn't done their homework and they were really setting themselves up for a massive heartbreak when and if Wizards of the Coast decided to send them a cease and desist or worse, if Wizards decided to take them to court, which they could based off of the stuff that I was seeing. We're gonna talk about a few things here, mostly based around published works, but also I'm gonna to touch on a few things related to YouTube as well as people are also breaking a lot of rules here too, myself included, but I'll explain why I choose to break those rules. And last note guys, I am not a lawyer. Seriously, I'm not a lawyer. This video is not meant as legal advice. When in doubt, talk to a lawyer. Got it? Okay, disclaimer done. Okay, let's start with a few quick terms. Trademark, copyright, and patent. Trademark is simple and not something you generally need to worry about. Typically, these will refer to business names and logos, etc., like McDonald's and Nike. In our world, trademarks should almost be impossible to infringe on if you're doing the right thing, and I'll explain why here in a bit. The next item is the copyright. This is the biggie here. This is where most people get into trouble trying to make products for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. The easiest way to think about copyright is that it sort of governs exactly what's in its name or a person's right to copy something. In short, people become confused about copyright in regards to creating content because of the 5th edition OGL, or Open Gaming License. The OGL was released by Wizards of the Coast as a way to share their game and allow people to create material for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. And it is accompanied by its sister document, the SRD, or System Reference Document. 
But the OGL is not a free-for-all like many people think it is. The OGL, even though it has the word open in it, does not just open up the game of Dungeons & Dragons for people to copy anything they want from the player's handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, or Monster Manual. In fact, I would recommend people think of it more like a restricted gaming license, as it defines the restrictions on what people can and cannot copy in their creative works from Wizards of the Coast. Besides reading the OGL four different times, which I would recommend anyone looking to publish game material to do, I will very, very briefly summarize it here for you. If you want to copy something from the SRD or system reference document, you may do so. You must include the full OGL without changing a single letter, space, or punctuation mark verbatim. You may not reference Dungeons and Dragons, D&D, PHB, DMG, Monster Manual, etc. anywhere within your published work. As well as you may not use any trademarked terms or better described as IP or intellectual property in your work. The intellectual property you cannot touch is actually listed in the OGL itself. These include basically anything Wizards of the Coast created, like Beholders, Mind Flayers, Yonti, etc., and named items like Dritzt, Faerun, Underdark, and so on. Now, it's very important to understand that if it isn't in the SRD, it's not covered by the OGL. So yes, this means named spells, magic items from the Dungeon Master Guide, any monster not in the SRD, to a point, or feats. If it's not in the SRD, you cannot copy it. Now, why did I say monsters to a point? Well, that's because you cannot directly copy any monster that Wizards has created, but there might be some ambiguity, ambiguity if you are creating a similar monster. Let me give you an example. The Kobold stat block is in the SRD, so you can print and publish that stat block as much as you want for money or not, as long as you're following the rules in the OGL. However, the winged kobold is not in the SRD, which means you cannot copy that stat block to publish it. But that doesn't mean you couldn't create your own version of a winged kobold with its own unique stat block. Although it might. Confusing, right? Let me break it down. Wizards of the Coast has zero rights to the term kobold. Its origin is from the 17th century, so they obviously don't own it any more than they own goblins, elves, dwarves, Though they do own the halfling, I think, as Tolkien coined the term hobbit, so obviously they couldn't use that. I'm not 100% there either. Uh, so circling back to kobolds, you could argue, if sued and in court across from the Wizards of the Coast attorneys, that you have as much right to create a creature dubbed winged kobold as Wizards does. But that also depends. How different is your stat block from the one that they've already published in Volos? That's for the judge to decide. One more addition to this line of thinking real quick. While it might be feasible for you to include your own stat block for a winged kobold, you may have significantly more difficult time defending yourself if you made your own version of a kobold dragon shield, which was included in Volo's Guide to Monsters, as the name is significantly more specific than just winged kobold. Again, use common sense, consult a lawyer if you need to, or better yet, Make your own creation entirely and just make a scale guard kobold with a totally different stat block than the kobold dragon shield and you're all good. Now all of this is if you want to publish your own material and or use whatever bits are in the SRD. But what if you want to publish your own Faerun adventures using names like the Red Wizards of Fae? Can you do that? Actually, yes, but only in the DMs Guild. Before I talk about the DM skill though, I want to give a huge shout out to today's sponsor, Jetpack7, and their incredible recent work, Legendary Dragons, which I am very proud to say I was a contributing writer for. Legendary Dragons is a book all about dragons. It's a fantastic reference book for dungeon masters looking to burn away their players with some awesome dragon fire. It's filled with legendary dragons, new player options, magic items, new dragon-related monsters, and kin. This book was so much fun to write for, and to be honest, I feel incredibly fortunate to be included alongside some of the industry's best. Link to this amazing book down below, and be sure to use code TAKING20 at checkout for an extra 10% off for the entire lineup over at Jetpack 7. So it's perfect time for the holidays. Okay, so what's the difference between the OGL and the DMs Guild? There are two avenues I want to discuss, the type of content and the money aspect. 
First off, the DM's Guild is a new creation from Wizards of the Coast in the 5th edition era of the game that allows creators to have access to a limited set of settings, which you can find in their FAQ section. What do I mean by have access to? Well, Wizards allows creators to use all those things that they do not allow you to use with the OGL, like Dritz, Mind Flayers, Red Wizards of Thay, etc. Why though? Why would Wizards make the distinction? Simple. That has to do with the money aspects. And might I add, it's a really great system, though I know people are already going to be clamoring in the comments section about it. In short, on the DMs Guild, you only keep 50% of the money that you earn using their intellectual property. Additionally, anything that you publish on the DMs Guild must only be published on the DMs Guild. Now, before you raise your pitchforks in anger, I think it's best to understand the full scope of the picture. The DMs Guild is not ran by Wizards of the Coast. It's a distribution system, specifically a reskinned website of one bookshelf, or as you might also know it as Drive Through RPG. So let's take a look at the breakdown of the two most common options you have to release digital products. Option one, you can publish your product according to the rules of the OGL, so no intellectual property like Faerun, through drive through RPG exclusively there, meaning you cannot Kickstarter your product later for 70% of the profits, or you may publish it non-exclusively there for 65% of the profits. Or option two, you can publish DMs Guild material, which may include some intellectual property from Wizards for 50% of the profit. Obviously, I assume this is because one bookshelf gets their cut, then Wizards gets their cut, then you get the biggest of the three cuts at 50% of the profit. And again, this gives you access to tell all kinds of crazy stories using Wizards IP, like Dritz, Bruner, and Elminster all hook up in a crazy fantasy during your published adventure. Who knows? Your other option is, of course, to publish your material on your own. But again, it can only be with the SRD material via the OGL, if you want to release a Kickstarter or so on. And if you do decide to publish under the OGL, you must include clear indications of any IP or intellectual property that you have created. Got it? Good. Now let's move on to patents a bit because there is a very important distinction I want to talk about relating to creating your own game. In short, patents cover inventions or new creations. Patents are very, very hard to get in the gaming world. Why? Because you cannot patent a game mechanic generally. Trying to patent the gaming mechanic of rolling a die and adding a modifier cannot be done because you clearly didn't invent that concept. Just like wizards cannot patent the concept of leveling up, having hit points, casting spells, or even having a modifier for your character called strength. So in short, you can create your own role-playing game using many of the same mechanics as Dungeons and Dragons or GURPS or Edge of the Empire. Can you carbon copy them? No. Then you get into the realm of copyright and you might win or lose a court case depending on just how egregious you have been during your replication process. But none of the game mechanics are patentable. Something of interest to this discussion, Wizards of the Coast does not have a patent for Dungeons and Dragons to my knowledge or what I could look up online for this video. However, they do actually have a gaming mechanic successfully patented. The Magic the Gathering tapping mechanic if you've never played Magic the Gathering, it's simply a game mechanic that allows players to signal that they have used their mana for the turn or activated an ability. And yes, that game mechanic, that game mechanic is actually patented because it is so incredibly specific in the patent that they were granted. However, building a pre-constructed deck or drawing a card every turn, every turn is fair game for any game designer. Okay, so now I want to shift backwards to trademark again and answer the question as to why it's so difficult to get into trouble for using someone else's trademark in this industry. Because the OGL straight up tells you that you cannot mention Dungeons and Dragons, D&D, Monster Manual, etc. So as long as you're following the rules in the OGL that you can't do that, you should be good. Except one thing which people constantly overlook, and this is a biggie. 
I, of course, am talking about trade dress. What is trade dress? In simple terms, it's the look of something. It's what gives it that distinct feel to consumers that this is an official product by the company I expect it to be from. In Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition publishing world, it's the fonts, the dark red paragraph headers, the red slash across the bottom third of an official Dungeons & Dragons 5e book, the way that stat blocks are laid out, and so on. When I was at Gen Con this year, I had two younger fans come up to me after a panel and they put an absolutely beautiful spiral bound book in my hand that they had been working on for over a year. I mean, guys, it was gorgeous as I flipped through it, but I knew the moment I saw it and they explained to me their plans to kickstart it that I was about to absolutely crush them with the truth. The entire book had to be redone. Why? because they made the thing look exactly identical to an official Dungeons & Dragons book. From the cover, to the font, to the way that they spent hours lining up each paragraph with the correctly sized headings, all of it. All that was missing from this book was the red D&D ampersand on the front. They looked so desperately crushed, and I could tell that they had put countless hours in Adobe InDesign on it, but the bottom line is I saved them countless more hours with a legal mess because I explained to them what trade dress is. Okay, so what can you do? I suggest opening a Jetpack 7 book like Legendary Dragons and looking at how they approached stat blocks and then looking at another third party 5e book and seeing what they did differently. You'll notice those books don't look like official Wizards of the Coast books. They have their own designs. It's very distinctive that allow consumers to understand that they are not trying to trick them into thinking these are official books. So always take trade dress into account if you want to avoid a legal mess. Okay, next up, images. Holy moly images. If you want to avoid legal issues, pay for art. Seriously, do not use any art that you do not own. If you are using stock images or images purchased cheaply because they will be uh, also used by others, follow the rules in the contract for crediting those artists in the stock art. And finally, in relation to images, I'm gonna talk about fair use. As I'm a YouTuber, I am quite familiar with fair use rules. And if I may toot my own horn a bit here, I feel like I have a, a really good understanding and, and maybe a better understanding than some of my colleagues here on the platform after talking with quite a few of them and even advising them in some instances. First off, I break fair use rules. I admit it. There's a lot of material throughout my tenure on YouTube that breaks fair use rules. And I have done it with my eyes open, so to speak. Additionally, almost all of your favorite channels break these rules as well. Almost every thumbnail you could see uh, could have their content pulled down from WebDM to RuneSmith, XP to level three, sorry Jacob, certainly Nerdarchy, and so on. All of us use images that we do not own and in no way fall under fair use. So what is fair use? It has to be informative, transformative, commentative, cannot impede the original market and or parody. Now, these are not the four factors of fair use, but rather the exceptions in copyright. So informative is where most people get into trouble. Just because you're talking about Dungeons and Dragons does not mean you can include images about said subject. This image here is of the sorcerer. Now, if I included this in the video as I was discussing the sorcerer, even though my content was informative slash educational and kind of transformative, that doesn't mean that I could use this image because it has nothing to do with the image itself. Now, if I instead spoke about the specifics of the image, like how I might take issue with the expression on the sorcerer's face, and then went on to demonstrate additional artistic factors when critiquing the design that would constitute fair use. I'm using the image in a transformative way that does not impede the original market for the image. The bottom line is, unless you are incredibly confident in your understanding for fair use, don't use others' images in your blog, on your Patreon, or in your published works. Just because you used a small portion of an image you found along the border in the artwork in your book does not under any circumstance make that fair use. Like I have actually heard people say to me before. Okay guys, I know that was a lot of information and I really tried to go through that and just pound through that, that info as fast as I could. So this may be one of those videos you wanna bookmark and come back to later if you have another question. Also, comment section. This is the video that I'm really looking forward to the comments because if you have a question, this is the video to ask it in. If you 
uh, are a viewer here and you have experience with copy my trade or copyright trademarks and patents, you know, this is the video where people are going to need to hear from you and have your own experience. Also, I will just say, if you do ask a question and somebody immediately says something, maybe take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, uh, be, unless they say, I'm a lawyer, this is legal advice. I know that kind of contradicts what I just said uh, about asking questions, but make sure that what they're saying and what you're reading in copyright and your trademarks and patents and your homework is all lining up and they're just there for clarification. So this is a great video for the comment section. I, of course, want to give a massive shout out to all of my amazing sexy ass patrons over at welcomeadventures.com. If you guys like what I do here, you want to support more content like this, uh, welcomeadventures.com is a great way to do that. So uh, yeah, that. <laughs> if this is your first time here and you love role playing games as much as I do, or you're learning to love role playing games as much as I do, I would love to have you subscribe. Every week I put out, well, minus the last little bit, every week I put out new videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit that subscribe button down below. Where, where is it? Down here? I think it's here. Uh, and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.